Thank you for the opportunity to honor a great scholar, Jennifer O'Reilly. I wish to speak about her contribution to our growing understanding of early medieval Irish and British art. Since the 1980s, a wealth of archeological discoveries and new archeological methods have revealed so much about the genesis of the visual art style that is called insular. On the screen, uh, we see a sampling of recently discovered objects which have transformed our view of early medieval culture across the Gallic and Anglo-Saxon world. This rich new evidence of material culture has come to us by a range of events and processes from chance metal detectors finds such as the Staffordshire and Galloway hordes to large projects that include systematic explorations of chronogs in Ireland and Scotland, large scale excavations on Iona and the Tarbat Peninsula of Dunod and of the Prittlewell burial. Our growing understanding of this culture's brilliance has been enabled by new technologies, advanced archeological methods, and laws requiring investigation of construction sites. Increased public awareness has furthered the cause too. The portable antiquity scheme and education through museums and programs, such as the training of farmers and peat cutter operators in Ireland. Remember, it was a peat cutter operator who recognized the fat and more salter. We have a previously unimaginable catalog of objects and an unprecedented depth of interpretation. Alongside rising awareness of insular material cultures sophistication, Dr. Jennifer O'Reilly stands out among scholars asking new questions in their studies of early medieval textual and visual culture. Dr. O'Reilly lectured on medieval history at University College Cork until her retirement in 2008. She headed the establishment of an art history degree program in that department while teaching, publishing her groundbreaking studies and serving in key administrative roles. During her very busy years of the 1980s, she somehow always found time to write an early career scholar such as myself, even inviting me to stay at Dunowen when in Cork. Letters from Jennifer always conveyed her generosity, her energy, and the intensity with which she approached her work. This year marks the fifth anniversary of her death. It is an appropriate time to remember her vast contribution to the history of insular art and to bring attention to her brilliant scholarship's potential to bring another dimension of understanding to these recently discovered objects. Some of her most insightful studies were on the images in two famous manuscripts, the Codex Amiatinus, that massive and highly important one volume Bible manuscript made at Wormuth Jarrow in the late seventh or early eighth century, and the Book of Kells, a lavishly decorated manuscript of the four gospels made probably around 800, quite possibly at Iona. On the screen, her portrait casts a fresh and profoundly knowledgeable gaze upon two of their folios. I wish here to spread awareness of the magnitude of her scholarship and its continuing relevance to medieval studies. To introduce the extraordinary Prittlewell burial, I am showing everyone the burial's location, the pair of gold crosses found in it and the excellent 500 page report the result of years of study by a team of dozens of specialists under the Museum of London Archaeology Unit. The burial was discovered in 2003 during investigations of an area of Roman and early Anglo-Saxon burials in the Prittlewell area of South End on Sea in Essex. The chance decision to place the first evaluation trench a little farther to the east resulted in its placement directly over an intact and richly furnished early Anglo-Saxon grave. Using the Prittlewell gold crosses as entry-level objects, I will present the main points of Jennifer's unique methodology and her ideas about relationships of image and viewer. Then I'm going to give some examples to show how Jennifer's scholarship 
may open new dimensions to our view of these exciting objects. We see now the burial chamber's reconstruction. It's surrounded by some of the objects conserved by the specialist team from the Museum of London. Their detailed report epitomizes the abilities of present day archeology. span The tomb's reconstruction and its objects are evocative of beginnings of medieval culture in its physical and imaginative dimensions. The Molas team have unpacked vast amounts of information from each object. They have shed light on the social context of a sixth century elite person who lived during the beginning of Christianity's growth in Anglo-Saxon England. Now to consider the pair of gold foil crosses, which the archeological team think may have been placed over the eyes of the person buried in the tomb. The archeologists suggest that the crosses were intended as amulets to protect the soul from evil. The crosses reveal the deceased's Christianity. It is remarkable in the sixth century, possibly decades before the mission sent by Pope Gregory to the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Kent. I begin with the Prittlewell tomb because besides the Christian features, it clearly projects status and power in its external appearance. But Jennifer detailed many times in her scholarship that the sense of vision in the early medieval period was not just external. Its power lay as a path to the interior of the viewer, a path that acted in the imagination of the Christian viewer. In the Prittlewell monograph, Simon Bernal points out the depiction of the cross borne by Christ in Simon of Cyrene in the late sixth century gospel book known as the St. Augustine Gospels, made in Italy, but now in Cambridge. This manuscript was present early in the seventh century in England. It probably arrived with one of the early Roman missionary groups who were dispatched to assist the original mission sent in 596 by Pope Gregory I. And this was under the leadership of the Roman monk Augustine, thus we have the Augustine Gospel. This small picture is within a grid of scenes from the Gospels. Simon Bernal compares the Prittlewell gold crosses with the Latin form of the cross carried in the picture by Christ and Simon of Cyrene. He argues that the idea for the gold boa crosses came from a Roman Christian context. The degree to which Christianity in southeastern England had ties with Rome in the sixth century cannot be known by us in much detail, but these emphatically Latin crosses in such a high status grave suggest that a significant connection existed. Why would crosses be placed over the eyes of the dead? Simon Bernal points out the rich significances the crosses would have brought to the burial. The idea of sight's path to the soul has its basis in scripture and was developed in patristic and insular commentaries, prayers, and liturgy. That is a prominent theme in Jennifer's scholarship. She may show us how the crosses can be understood as an embodiment in appropriate form and material of an internalization of Christianity belonging to the person in the burial chamber. Crosses had, by the end of the sixth century, become a decorative element integrated, often concealed in all media. The act of viewing them could serve contemplative revelation of Christian beliefs, Christ's incarnation, sacrifice, and promise of salvation and resurrection. The Codex Amiatinus begins with a series of tables and diagrams. These are based on the writings of St. Jerome. Amiatinus has the best and earliest surviving manuscript of Jerome's Vulgate edition of the Latin Bible. One of the diagrams, now on the right, concerns the books of the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Old Testament. Each of the small circles in it has a slightly compressed comment of Jerome from a letter to Paulinus of Nola. These concern the mysteries or signs of divine meaning in each book of the Pentateuch. A blue band entwines the five circles 
tracing smaller loops between them, but it increases the number of loops in the upper and lower arms of the arrangement to draw a Latin cross. A simply designed diagram of the books of the law and their interpretation becomes a vision of Roman Christian orthodoxy. Visual apprehension of the Latin cross is analogous to the viewer's spiritual transformation. Seeing the Latin cross is a necessary element of transformation of the diagram from a list of the books of Moses to Christian sign revealing prophetic truths. It is worth pointing out here that uh, Jerome's comments on numbers, he says, contains hidden mysteries of all the measures and quantities it mentions. Jerome says of Leviticus, which is in the center circle, that it's every word, including on the vestments of the priest Aaron, signifies heavenly sacred things. We shall see two relevant objects from the Staffordshire Horde. Besides textual and iconographic relationships to some of the objects we are going to see, the diagram brings out Jennifer's fundamental concern to understand insular art's call to a spiritual vision. Jennifer makes concise methodological and conceptual statements in her 1987 article, Early Medieval Text and Image, published in Peritzia, the Journal of the Medieval Academy of Ireland. In the article, she investigates the iconography of a late 10th century Anglo-Saxon whalebone panel. On it, Christ, hands up and chest bared, sits enthroned within a mandorla between figures of the Virgin and St. Peter. Beneath them, a pair of hovering angels holds the arms of a cross and eight figures look up at it. The mandorla's border is inscribed, videte manus et pedes, see my hands and feet, an abbreviation of the Gospel of Luke chapter 24, verse 39. The inscription refers to the five wounds of Christ's crucified and resurrected body. His bared chest displays the spear wound, his hands and originally his feet, the nail piercings. Jennifer explains her aim to understand, quote, something of the imaginative processes of an early medieval monastic culture. The basis of her method was the patristic contemplative practice of the Catena, a prayer-like form of exegesis which linked together chains of biblical texts to reveal scripture's underlying spiritual meaning, a meaning hidden from the literal reader. Insular monastic culture perpetuated this tradition with its themes maintained and developed since Christianity's first centuries, but she says, could also use that tradition to make new associations or creatively restate established things. Writing of the ivory as a highly elusive pictorial exegesis, Jennifer traces a chain of text that appears as early as a sixth century sermon of Caesarius of Oral and in later Old English eschatological literature. The theme describes Christ enthroned in majesty. He tells sinners, see the marks left by the nails, the wounds in my side. No single gospel mentions all five wounds or the enthroned Christ. The exegetical and devotional tradition derives from verses and gospels of Matthew and Mark and revelations as well for the enthronement. And from the post-resurrection accounts in Luke and John for the wounds, the phrase, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced is from Zechariah, John and revelations invocation of seeing the wounds. This katana presented an ancient theme that underlay a devotional image familiar to early medieval Christians. It evoked their compunction to recognize the incarnate Christ, his sacrifice on earth and his heavenly presence, whence he would appear to judge mankind. His wounds testifying to his human and divine nature. Often the images were inscribed with these textual references inspiring imaginative conversation between text and image. The whalebone ivory represents a summation of all these concepts in a single object. The chain of paradoxical crucifixion 
resurrection, triumph, and enthronement were closely associated throughout the Middle Ages, becoming elaborated and adapted in devotional and liturgical forms. Always the experience of the viewer was the target of the textual and visual forms. This experience took place in the viewer's imagination, invoking compunction and an interiorization of the ideas of Christian salvation. Jennifer understood the Catena's flexibility. It emerges in many of her publications alongside other themes. The large gold cross in the Staffordshire hoard is one of the most striking of recent insular discoveries. The Staffordshire hoard itself is famous as the largest find of Anglo-Saxon gold. Metal detectorist Terry Herbert discovered it in 2009 in a field in the West Midlands of England in the parish of Hammerwich, which is near Lichfield. Currently on display at the Potteries Museum and Art Gallery in Stoke-on-Trent, the hoard, its site, and all the objects have been conserved, studied in detail, and written up in a 600-page publication of the Society of Antiquaries of London. This is the result of a 10-year study by a team, again, of dozens of experts. Only a small number of the objects in the hoard did not come from prestige weapons, such as sword hills. The large cross is one of these few non-military items. It, like nearly all the other hundreds of objects in the hoard, was crumpled and fragmented before deposition in the seventh century. Arresting though it is, even in its reconstruction, it does not speak openly to modern viewers. As Jennifer said of another insular work, it presents a mystery revealed yet concealed. In the excellent discussions in the Society of Antiquaries Monograph, it is understood as a splendid processional or altar cross, originally set with six garnets, a Latin cross with an equal armed cross at its center as seen in the reconstruction drawing. The monograph gives detailed discussions of its material and background in early medieval culture. Moreover, many scholars have analyzed the significance of red garnets in Anglo-Saxon gold crosses is iconography of the wounds of Christ. Seventh century viewers certainly would have contemplated the wounds, the divine and human natures, and the promise of salvation. The Staffordshire cross's surface is decorated also with animal interlace, which is directly from the pre-Christian art traditions of the Anglo-Saxons. The monograph's authors reason that its skilled integration of beautifully rendered native decoration with the elegant design of the Christian cross indicates its production in an elite wealthy context within decades of the mission from Rome. The archeologist Chris Fern suggests that the form of the protrusions at the ends of the upper arms of the cross are a native innovation, integrating shapes of animal ears consistent with the object's zoomorphic art. This would create a vision of the cross as a living thing, the symbol of the incarnate and crucified Christ. Crosses were living things in early medieval Christianity, often with reference to the tree in the Genesis story of the fall. Another interpretation may see the protrusions as suggestions of leaves. The Staffordshire cross represents a version of the jewel triumphal crosses created for early Christian Roman emperors. The most famous and, and splendid Crux Germata or jewel cross was erected by Emperor Theodosius II about 420 on the hill of Calvary. Some actual examples of the fifth to eighth centuries survive such as the sixth century jeweled cross of Justin II, now in the treasury of St. Peter's in Rome. Jeweled crosses are depicted in early apse mosaics in Rome and Ravenna, in which it signifies the triumphant resurrected body 
of the living Christ appearing from heaven, as in the seventh century mosaic in Rome. The triumphal crosses often have protrusions from the ends of the upper beams. In the Roman apse, the cross appears amid flowering plants in a grassy landscape, the early Christian image of heavenly paradise. Jennifer O'Reilly wrote about this relationship of cross and tree in medieval art and literature. In an early publication, she addressed the complex iconography of a late Anglo-Saxon portable altar. At the top of the altar's frame, the crucified Christ appears in a heavenly eschatological scene, hanging upon a cross of rough hewn timber, a reference to the tree of life. The earliest surviving English depiction of the rough hewn cross is in the early 11th century Harley 603 Psalter, but she showed the concept's familiarity from at least the sixth century in exegesis, liturgy, and hymns. In the Harley Psalter, it references the splendid imperial Roman standard of triumph, the vexillum, but adorned with the instruments of the passion. Its paradox as rough hewn tree and shining vexillum is part of its effectiveness as a mystery or sign intended for contemplation to reveal something of the salvation offered to those who take the idea by a sight of the cross into their hearts. Visual images of the cross as tree of life were being made by the sixth century. Ampules, that is small containers for holy oil, were made in the Holy Land for pilgrims to take home. Many bear an image of the cross made of palm branches. The one seen here has the palm cross upon Golgotha, encircled by the Greek inscription, oil from the tree of life. As Leslie Webster suggests in her essay on the Staffordshire Gold Cross, its animal ornament may represent a local substitute for the vine scrolls, which appear on some early Byzantine jeweled crosses. In his memorial lecture, Eamon O'Carragoyne cited Jennifer's interpretation of the vine scroll on the early eighth century Ruthwell cross, where it is filled with diverse creatures feeding on its fruit. She brought to us an understanding of the multi-dimensional significance of the tree of life. At Ruthwell, it is the axis at the center of the world, joining heaven and earth and providing spiritual food and healing for all. Simultaneously, as a Eucharistic sign, it regenerates a Mediterranean image of the incorporation of all the faithful members of the church into the sacramental and glorified body of Christ, end of quote. Moreover, she saw that vine scrolls with animal inhabitants on Anglo-Saxon stone crosses could reveal the stone cross as the arbor vitae the cosmological tree of life, emphasizing the seeming paradox of his divine and human natures. Native zoomorphic ornament used to represent the cross as a living corporeal thing, which simultaneously has a cosmological existence, appears early in insular art at Ruthwell and in the early eighth century Lindisfarne gospels. In one of the diagrams of the biblical books in the Codex Amiatinus, flower and leaf forms convey the living cross by sprouting from angles of its cross shapes. The ends of the cross's beams sprout a leaf at each angle, resembling the Staffordshire cross's projections. The shape of the cross could be decoratively decorated, modified, or inscribed. The cross is tree of life materialized a cosmological sign of a fundamental Christian mystery. The dual nature of Christ, human and divine, whose physical body resurrected remains in heaven and on earth in the community of believers to return at the end of time, displaying his wounds as testimony of his incarnate and divine natures.
Jennifer's groundbreaking paper on the crucifixion picture in the late seventh century Durham Gospels gives a detailed interpretation against the complex late seventh century theological background. The Durham Gospels were made in Ireland or in a Northumbrian monastery with a definite Irish presence. Fairly visible Latin inscriptions surround the picture and all but two are too complex to deal with now. The top margin, red arrow, admonishes the viewer to contemplate Christ's crucified body, his dual nature and sacrifice. Translation, know who and what kind he is, who suffered such things for us, caused by this, our sin, whose title is, in whom no sin was found. The top arm of the cross has an extended version of the abbreviated title, which the Roman soldiers placed onto it, the INRI. Either side of the upper arm are inscribed with the Greek letters, Alpha and Omega, a title Christ used of himself, the beginning and the end, here leaving no doubt as to his true identity and emphasizing the paradox of crucifixion between two thieves and eternal divine nature. Dressed in the priestly ankle length garment, Christ's body displays nails in hands and feet and conforms to the cross's unusual shape. Its transverse beam placed so that it is the visual center of the picture. Either side of the top arm, a pair of angelic beings chants, Sanctus, Christ's body is present in heaven, eternally praised in the heavenly liturgy as in revelations. On the lower earthly half, the Roman soldier thrusts his spear into Christ's side and another raises the sponge to Christ's face. Elements of the scriptural narratives are compressed into one synchronous image that prompts the viewer to contemplate the crucified body and the symmetrical cosmological cross that spans the cardinal points of earth and heaven and all of time. My highly simplified summaries of Jennifer's profound interpretations may help to understand the ways in which even a now fragmented cross would have addressed its early medieval audience. The Tully Loch cross was found on the bottom of a lake in County Roscommon, Ireland in 1986, probably in the condition we see here. It was a processional end altar cross, probably made in the early ninth century. Gilt bronze metalwork pieces are mounted on both sides of a wooden core. Each side has two plaques bearing a human figure, hands upraised in a pose of prayer and flanked by a pair of open jawed animals. Jennifer's extensive explorations of crucifixion iconography spotlighted insular creative representation of the human figure to make reference to and elaborate upon the body of Christ. These figures may represent variations on the crucified body meant to invoke the viewer's spiritual vision. In the Durham Gospels crucifixion figure, remember Christ's arms coincide with the centrally placed crossbar. They turn unnaturally outward at the elbow. The body takes on the shape of the cosmological cross in that picture, creating a sign of his unity of heaven and earth, human and divine. The upraised arms of the Tully Loch figures merge a pose of prayer with the pose of martyrs and crucifixion, invoking the sacrifice of the incarnate Christ. The animals bring imagery of Daniel in the lion's den for insular viewers, a sign of Christian martyrdom, but also the composition's symmetry recalls images of enthronement, heavenly exaltation. The figure in the upper panel has his eyes open. The lower has his eyes closed. Perhaps this is a mnemonic of earthly vision's limits and the truth of spiritual vision look upon him. But this fragmentary object yields only a suggestion of the original cross's conversation with scripture and its early medieval viewers. 
the cross as contemporary, the Book of Kells, has a picture of the body of Christ to compare with the Tully Wolf figures. The picture is placed in the Gospel of Matthew. It has above Christ's head Matthew's words at the end of the account of the Last Supper. Christ's body becomes simultaneously a cross in the pose of prayer, as in the Tully Wolf figures, and an X or a key, a version of the cross and the letter of Christ. Crucifixion and sacrifice are emphasized with the cross-shaped capitals either side of his head and the text on the facing page, which merges bread and body, wine and blood, in sign and sacrifice. Jennifer wrote of this picture as a monumental hieratic image, the composition of which radically renews early Christian representations of the exalted Christ as triumphal cross or the key beneath an honorific arch. Her detailed pursuit of chains of text, all the elements of the picture in the Book of Kells has many resonance with other figures in insular art that have iconographic associations with the crucifixion. Besides the cross and crucifixion, an interpretative chain which Jennifer pursued was the patristic and early medieval conversion of themes in the Pentateuch, the Ark of the Covenant and priesthood to figures of Christ, Christian writers and the church. Her rich assembly of texts, which she elegantly relates to the pictures in the Codex Amiatinus, reveals their six sophisticated exposition of the eloquence of Jerome's Vulgate Latin Bible. As mentioned when looking at the Pentateuch cross diagram in Amiatinus, numbers, according to Jerome, gives numbers and measures of the earth that are signs of divine truth. Versions of phrases from numbers, as chapter 10 verses 35 to 36, are inscribed in Latin on both sides of the Staffordshire hoard's fragmentary gold strip. The words, rise up, O Lord, and may your enemies be scattered, and those who hate you flee before your face. This is Moses' daily prayer, calling upon God's presence in the ark to protect the Jews from their enemies as they continue their journey through the desert with the ark carried before them. Psalm 67 has a version of it, and patristic psalm commentaries consistently associate it with Moses. The prayer appears to have been familiar enough in 8th century Mercian context to have been put in the mouth of the East Anglian ex-warrior hermit, St. Guthwack. In the Society of Antiquaries monograph, Leslie Webster, Michelle Brown, and Alan Thacker place the strip and its inscription in early Anglo-Saxon religious, social, and political contexts. They convincingly argue that the strip was part of a cross that was attached to a reliquary, pointing out that arca was a word used for reliquaries. Jennifer wrote interpretations of the pictures of the tabernacle and the scribe in the Codex Amiatinus, as well as the depictions of the temple and ark in the Book of Kells and Armagh. She related them to Bede's exegetical works on the tabernacle and the temple. While she never explored Moses's prayer over the ark, she wrote about the intense exegetical attention paid to it in insular Christianity. Webster, Brown, and Thacker emphasized the consistency of the overwhelmingly militaristic nature of the Staffordshire horde with the context and content of Moses's prayer. The inscribed strip would seem to fit on a reliquary carried before troops as they marched into battle. Jennifer wrote very little on the secular associations and supernatural protective functions of insular art, but she laid out in depth the significance of the ark and tabernacle for insular Christian culture. Her scholarship on Bede's exegesis immerses us in the richness of his use of the divinely designed structures as interpretative figures of the body of Christ which could be an appropriate reference 
for a cross attached to a reliquary. In her essays on the Codex Samuatinus, Jennifer wrote important interpretations of the picture of the scribe. The scribe wears the vestments of a biblical high priest, including the headdress at the center of his forehead. Jerome consistently translated the Hebrew name for it as lamina aurea, or thin gold plate. One of the objects reconstructed from the Staffordshire hoard resembles the scribe's headdress in the picture, although it is not exactly the same. It does not have the four letters of the divine name as described in Exodus chapter 28, verse 36. The lamina aurea is mentioned also in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 9. In the Codex Amiatinus, this diagram of the books of the Pentateuch, we remember, uh, Jerome's comment on Leviticus from his letter to Paulinus is in the center. Every element of the priest's vestments signifies sacred heavenly things. Jerome briefly interprets the lamina aurea in another letter to a person named Fabiola. That's Epistle 64. He only comments on the significance of the dark blue ribbon which holds the lamina aurea to the priest's forehead. The word of God crowns and shields the priest with beauty. In the Staffordshire Horde monograph, Webster and Thacker discuss the object's possible historical relationships to late Roman and early medieval texts, and they propose possible significance of such a headdress in the seventh century church in England. Jennifer drew together the interpretations of Cassian, Origen, Jerome, Gregory, and Bede in her aim to uncover the significance of the Amiatina scribes' vestments. These writings could give some idea of what an object, such as the reconstructed headdress from the Staffordshire hoard, might have meant to the spiritual vision of a seventh century Anglo-Saxon. If the object from the Staffordshire hoard was made after biblical description and interpretations of the Lamina Aurea by Jerome and possibly Josephus, Bede's exegesis had not yet been written. Then looking at Jerome and Josephus, then the object which one of the authors of the monograph describes as too flimsy to be worn must have functioned in some symbolic way. The seventh century Anglo-Saxon imagination would have provided a fertile and rigorous ground in which the object could work as a crown and a shield for the beauty of the church as understood by the Anglo-Saxon elite who are so well represented in the hoard by heaps of splendid military equipment. Jennifer has drawn our attention to the insular interest in Jewish priestly vestments. They are described in Exodus and Leviticus and interpreted by Josephus, a first century Romano-Jewish historian. In her essay on the late 8th century St. Gall Gospels of Irish origins, which she left unfinished, she notes Bede's interpretations of the fine linen turban which covers and adorns the head of the high priest in his De Tabernaculo, writing on the tabernacle. He and Josephus describe a headdress like that worn by the figure of Matthew in the St. Gall Gospels. She points out that Bede considered Matthew the Hebrew evangelist, a feature stressed in the exegetical tradition on the Hebrew names in the Bible. The linen turban and lamina aurea make an appearance in the book of Kells in the picture of the temptation of Christ. The temple in Jerusalem is shown as the body of Christ with references to the tabernacle and the colors and design over its exterior. A figure stands in what seems to be the doorway. I don't really know, it looks like a doorway. At first glance, the figure seems to have a halo in, outlined in red, or maybe that's his hair. The careful look reveals folds and an embellishment at center front. The best explanation for this headdress is that it's based on the scriptural and exegetical 
descriptions of the linen turban with the lamina aurea over the forehead. Jennifer eliminates patristic and insular interpretations based on Katina chains of text to propose that the temple in the illustration refers to the priesthood within the body of Christ. This theme is linked to Jerome's interpretation of Luke as the priest, his sign as the ox calf of sacrifice. According to Jennifer, the figure in the book of Kells, like the scribe in Amiatinus, is the holy man who studies the chains of meaning in scripture. For this reason, he is clothed in priestly vestments given by God to the priest Aaron. The vestments are signs of his having inscribed the spiritual wisdom of scripture on his heart and so is worthy to approach the ark. The Book of Kells calls upon the viewer's spiritual vision in many ways. Where the temptation picture presents a complex figure of the body of Christ and human figures within a scene, however complex its semiosis, it can be called a picture. The artists of the Book of Kells merged and mixed concepts of picture and diagram, picture and design to challenge spiritual vision. In these pages, artists made use of elements from native pre-Christian traditions of the Gallic or Celtic world. The cosmological X-shaped framework of the four symbols page before the Gospel of John integrates the spirals and trumpet patterns of late Latin art seen here in the seventh century hanging ball disc from Dunod, and it's a center bottom. The spirals inserted within the square insets in the outer border of the four symbols page emphasize the four part heavenly framework, which carries the four animals, signs of evangelists and their gospels. Jennifer wrote eloquent and innovative essays on the significance of such four part designs in insular gospel manuscripts. Seeing the patterns cover the surface of the shrine taken from the river Blackwater near Clamore in County Armagh, which is there sort of on the left center, um, one gets a sense that they too might have called in some way to spiritual vision, perhaps merging Christian signs with local traditions. In the St. Gall Gospels, cross patterns are concealed within the borders above and below the figure of the evangelist Mark, as Jennifer shows us. The side borders have large panels within each, a lozenge shape filled with spirals, carefully articulated with color. In each corner of the frame, rectangular panels present the symbols of the evangelist conveying, Jennifer says, their familiar allusion to the fourfold gospel and its revelation of Christ in his humanity and divinity, his kingship and priesthood. She cites Ernst Kitzinger's observations on the visual power of this frame, quote, by surrounding the evangelist with interlace and interlacing animal ornament, the insular artist coming from a more deeply rooted tradition of conveying spiritual force in visual terms had intensified the potency of imported representational art. One might be reminded of her words when seeing the Dragonstone from Port Mahomoc in Northeast Scotland, which is saying on the right. The stone was probably part of a three meter tall Pictish cross slab. The head of the cross would have been encircled by panels of spirals, some set in lozenges similar to the ones in the frame of the St. Gall Mark portrait. Jennifer writes almost exclusively about Christian art, rarely about pre-Christian tradition. Nevertheless, she shows us how insular artists merge aniconic and abstract shapes with representational images in creative and sophisticated ways. And she never published anything on the newly discovered objects I've presented. I hope, however, that you may see that what she wrote helps to set them in context, acknowledging that her approach to early medieval art 
is not the only one that is valuable in this way. Let us remember her and continue to benefit from her legacy of profound knowledge of patristic and early medieval culture and her unique method of seeing with the special imaginative vision of early medieval eyes. Jennifer never published a monograph or survey book, but the body of her work has a remarkable wholeness. That is part of its brilliance. Knowing this, some of us who knew her and her, her scholarship have edited three volumes of her writings published by Variorum in 2019 and now displayed on the screen. I wish to thank my co-editors, Elizabeth Mullins, Lauren McLaren, and Jeremy Scully. We are all extremely grateful to Tom O'Reilly and Professor Terry O'Reilly for seeing the volumes through to publication. Recently, Tom has given us the wonderful news that all three volumes are now available in paperback. As if that isn't good enough news, Variorum, I'll offer them now on the occasion of this memorial lecture at a special discount. Thank you.